Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, looking at audience, actually, uh, I'm not supposed to tell uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> except one lady uh, taking record and recording us and streaming us, etc. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, basically, uh, we have uh, streamed uh, and casting actually this uh, afternoon presentation and uh, many people uh, uh, follow actually the presentation uh, uh, at home or in their offices. Okay, so first let me welcome really cordially Professor uh, Erling Norby from originally Karolinska Institute Medical School uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, formerly, then he moved uh, to uh, Center of uh, uh, History of Sciences uh, at uh, uh, Swedish Academy of Sciences, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, Erling Norby is uh, one of uh, virology guru, actually, I must say. So when I was growing up as a virologist, so I was always following his papers, uh, I became, uh, I fall in love of paramyxo viruses, which uh, used to be the same cup of viruses as uh, early Norby studied. And honestly said, uh, I'm, uh, I must say that uh, I did mistake that uh, I didn't apply for my postdoc fellow at Karolinska Institute. Uh, Early Norby uh, used to uh, do lots of research on measles virus, yeah? and uh, it's a relative virus to mumps virus or respiratory sensitive virus, and all these uh, group of paramyx uh, viruses, which uh, are basically causative agents of uh, child uh, infectious diseases. Uh, but uh, with uh, once a while, with really severe consequences in terms of immunopathogenesis of diseases, so, which uh, usually in sort of uh, complicated cases uh, uh, lead to uh, severe encephalopathies with some, of course, uh, non-desirable uh, impact for kids. Yeah. Uh, that's a very demanding topic of uh, clinical or medical virology. Erlin Norby uh, uh, has uh, joined his life with uh, uh, Karolinska Institute and uh, he served like uh, a chair of Institute of Virology uh, for 25 years. Uh, within this period of time, he uh, was appointed a dean of medical school at Karolinska Institute, and uh, then uh, he slowly, or maybe he jumped to the uh, topic of uh, Nobel Prizes, and he uh, used to be working really deeply and being involved deeply uh, in uh, Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Nobel Prizes, as a member of. Uh, Nobel uh, Foundation and no Nobel Council. I don't know if there is a difference between, so maybe you will explain us. And uh, had spent uh, more than uh, 20 years actually with Nobel Prizes. And of course, uh, after such a long time, uh, he became tightly associated with the topic very exciting topic and uh, you can imagine what uh, interesting is when uh, after all of us after 50 years uh, archives of uh, uh, Nobel prizes uh, is open so and then uh, uh, bringing lots of uh, uh, interesting seek originally secrets yeah so then uh, he uh, actually switched for, uh, for the hobby of Nobel Prizes and uh, uh, working on uh, books uh, one by one uh, published all already having uh, issued like five uh, uh, books and working on the sixth book 
recently, and uh, his uh, yeah his contribution to infectious diseases and to Nobel prizes is definitely more than great. And what is also interesting, if you go through his uh, CV, that probably still uh, uh, Erling Norby is still a vice chairman of uh, J. Uh, Craig Venter Institute uh, uh, Council, yeah, which is also very interesting a uh, bit of information about him. Yep, so, and besides that, I forgot to mention that he, uh, after he left the uh, Institute of Virology at Karolinska Institute, uh, and served uh, uh, as a permanent uh, secretary of, uh, of the Royal uh, Swedish uh, Academy of uh, Sciences for about six years. Okay, so I'm really glad that uh, Erling Norby is uh, back again after 10 years. 10 years ago, he, uh, re uh, he uh, received uh, an honorary degree at Charles University and uh, being back again, welcome to, uh, to Czechia, to Prague and uh, to the learning new year. Yeah, so please, uh, the floor is yours and we are looking forward, forward to uh, listening your exciting Nobel Prizes story. <laughs> yeah. You have your yep. microphone. Yeah. So, thank you very much for that generous introduction. It is a particular pleasure to be back in Prague. Uh, I have traveled in this country since the 1960s even during the very gloomy years and interacting with virologists here and uh, very heartwarming contacts. And in some cases, they came to our laboratory in Stockholm and then continued on to the United States. So, so Prague has always had a special place in, in my heart. And as, as mentioned, I was extremely privileged to be honored with this honorary doctorate 10 years ago. And it's therefore a great joy to be back. I thought I would take a rather broad field. The Nobel Prize is a gene concept and the origin of molecular biology. And this is, to compress this into one hour is, of course, quite a demanding thing to do. Uh, but uh, a lot of the Nobel Prizes have been involved in highlighting critical developments that have been important in, develop in the advance of what we call molecular biology. So where did it all start? Well, when I looked into uh, Mendel, I realized he's born in 1822. There's a 200 years anniversary. So, so uh, this is, in a way, is of course a tribute to Mendel. But as you know, also, he, his discoveries remained uh, unidentified uh, and un unconfirmed until about the, the year 1900, when there were three major uh, plant geneticists to rediscover this work and, and identify this as certainly as a, an enormous milestone in the development of genetics. One of them was uh, Hugo de Vries from the Netherlands, who uh, also coined the word mutation, a change in a gene was referred to as, as mutation. But the word gene did not appear until some years later. And there was a follow-up uh, plant geneticist who uh, gave this name in 1909. So the gene comes from the Greek gonos, that means offspring. Now, it all, of course, as we now know, started with Friedrich Mischer, uh, who in 1871, I think it was, uh, discovered that there were a particular uh, group of substances in the cell, and he used mostly inflammatory cells that clearly distinguished themselves from protein. And the difference was that they did not contain any sulfur, but they did contain a lot of sulfur, phosphorus. And this was uh, confirmed by his uh, uh, calculator who, who was the head of his laboratory. So it was a, a true and solid finding. 
And only, uh, I think it was 11 years later, was the name nucleic acids introduced because uh, they, most of this was found in the nuclei. And, uh, but a lot of this remained uh, hidden. Uh, but there was a lot of curiosity about this nuclear material. And there's a Nobel Prize in 1910 where it's cited that he get Albert Kossel get his, his prize both for this protein studies and for the studies of nuclein in, uh, in cells. Uh, but then there were developments that kind of uh, restricted the further, let's say, highlighting of the role of nucleic acid. And this chemist, Phoebus Aaron Levin, he did important chemical analysis distinguishing the two kinds of nucleic acid and they in those days were referred to as, as uh, thymus nucleic acid and, and, and yeast nucleic acid but later of course DNA and, and RNA and he did important work on the sugars uh, but he in a way came to paralyze the field also because he concluded yes that there were four bases and they appear a rather monotonous uh, uh, proportions. R the reason being, of course, that he was not using separated material, he was using mixture of material. And therefore he said, uh, this is not a very interesting molecule uh, because it, 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 it looks essentially the same. And he made the scientists think that it's probably something like collagen or some support substance, uh, not without any unique uh, characteristics. And that uh, the statement paralyzed this field for a long, long time. Uh, although there were, uh, of course, uh, various uh, discoveries that, that were important in this. And if you now look at the Nobel Prizes, the first Nobel Prize for, uh, in, in, in genetics was to Thomas Morgan. And that was the use of fruit fly, and which essentially confirmed uh, Mendel's work on uh, dominating and recessive genes and so forth. Uh, and uh, very important work. And for a long, long time, the fruit fly remained the, the, the model of studies. And his pupil, who was um, Hermann G. Miller, uh, he learned that if you use irradiation, you could change the genetic material. So, mutations could be produced by X-ray uh, radiation. And he, in his turn, received a Nobel Prize in 1946. But before this, he made a very interesting statement in the 1920s. Uh, he was reflecting on uh, what, how one could study genes. And think about it, in those days, uh, one couldn't see genes as physical entities. Uh, but what, is, what he wrote was, it would give us an utterly new angle from which to attack the gene problem. They, the viruses, and now they, when I started to appreciate that there are bacterial viruses, the phages, they are filterable, to some extent isolatable, can be handled in, in test tubes it would be very rash to call these bodies genes. And yet, at uh, present, we must confess that there's no distinction known between the gene and them. Hence, we cannot categorically deny that perhaps we may be able to find genes in a mortar and cook them in a beaker after all. This was revolutionary, the whole idea. Could one study genes by regular biochemical methods? Uh, uh, on the side, let me mention also, he was uh, like a number of uh, intellectuals, scientists, uh, really hoping for uh, the, the solution for the world. And he was a very devoted communist. So in one of his books, he made the following dedication. Dear Comrade Stalin, as societies with confidence in the ultimate Bolshevik triumph through all possible spheres of human endeavor, I come to you with a matter of vital importance arising out of my own science, biology, and in particular genetics. And towards the end of the very long letter he wrote, banishing false gods, man, 
uh, organized under socialism most boldly assumes the uh, role of a creator conquering with Bolshevik associates, even that most impregnable po fortress that holds the key to uh, his own inner being. Uh, this is indeed hyperbolic statements, and he gradually had to take it back, back and not least realizing what an enormous damage Lysenko did to uh, genetics in uh, the Soviet Union. But that's a little um, parallel. Now, I will highlight Max Delbrück and his contributions. So, in my most recent book, I write about the Nobel Prizes in 69, 70, and 71. And 69, it's a fact, it's a late prize to the phage virologists, including Max Delbrück, uh, uh, Luria, and Hershey. And Delbrück, he was a physicist, and he was inspired by interaction with Niels Bohr. And in fact, I think the whole new ways of thinking it was something that the physicist pioneered because these were dramatic changes in physics. When you went from Newtonian physics to Einstein's 1905 Annulus Mirabilis, where energy and mass could be exchanged, the time could be one factor, and it was a complete revolution in an understanding of how material uh, really are constructed and so forth. So that opened the way also for biology to, 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 to try to attack this in a rational way. And Niels Bohr, he wrote in uh, Nature in uh, 1933 an article on, on light and life. That was just general philosophizing about the possibilities of doing in biology what had been done in uh, uh, physics, in, including also, of course, the, uh, the, the most advanced forms that, that still, still are there of in, in, in quantum physics that uh, is of a central topic into this present time. So anyhow, Max Delbrück, when he came back to Berlin, he worked in <coughs> uh, Lise Meitner's laboratory. And Lise Meitner uh, was one of the original discoverers of nuclear fission. Uh, to, together with Otto Hahn. And, uh, but she was also an Austrian Jew, and in 1938 she had to, to leave Berlin, and she escaped uh, Germany and ended up in Sweden, in fact. And it's a very special story. And of course, uh, Otto Hahn received the Nobel Prize in 1946, for the discovery of nuclear fission, and she was not included. And that is one of the things that have been discussed extensively. So physics was very important. And when Delbrück was, oh sorry, was in uh, Berlin, he interacted with a, a very colorful geneticist by the name of Nikolai Timofev Resovsky, uh, a Russian origin, and he, uh, he did very pioneering work, and there was also another uh, colleague called Zimmer, who were studying the effect of radiation on, on genes. And they had some informal seminars where they tried to discuss, would it be possible to decide the size of a gene by uh, looking at the sensitivity to uh, X-ray radiation? And they wrote a pretty famous paper about that, that's called the the green blood, uh, in a, uh, and uh, and a, and very very ambitious uh, c calculations on what 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 could be the size of a gene and how what could one learn from from irradiation. Then Delbrück got a Rockefeller scholarship, and he went out to Caltech to see if one, he could study genetics now with the, with a fruit fly which of course didn't work. But coincidentally, when he was there, he uh, learned to know of bacteriophages, some viruses that could infect bacteria, and they seemed to have offered a lot of uh, positive 
aspects on uh, how uh, one could study the genes. Uh, before looking into this, I wanted to mention two Swedish scientists who could have done very pioneering contributions. One was Einar Hammarström. He was the professor of biochemistry at the Karolinska Institute between 1928 and 55. He was heavily involved in the Nobel Prize work, and he did important thing with the nucleic acid without really understanding that he was handling gold, truly. He, uh, he never fully understood, and he was important, and I'll come back to that later, for the evaluations of Avery and the reason why Avery never got a prize. Tobion Kasperson is another interesting fellow uh, who was very close to making some major, major breakthroughs. Uh, one thing that they did together, to did together with uh, Thea Svedberg was that these were the days when I started to use ultra centrifuges. And one realized when running uh, nucleic acid ultra centrifuges that they had a very high molecular weight. And one just took notice, yes, yeah, so it has a high molecular weight, but what does it mean? And uh, well, no. later on, Kaspersson did work, and in parallel, uh, work, the same work was done by Brache in, in Belgium, where he looked at the extinction rates for, for at 280 and 260, and it so happens that proteins, they, have, they are, have a marker at 280 and nucleic acid at 260. And they saw that when protein synthesis started in cells, there was an increase in the nucleic acid, but they didn't there taken a conclusion from that. They, they could have really pushed the field, but that was not the way it was. Later on in life, also, Tobion Kasperson made a third discovery, very important. He and Lauret Sech, they discovered the banding technique for chromosomes, which had an enormous importance. And uh, that could also, and as you can imagine, has been ev evaluated for a potential Nobel Prize to Kasperson but he never received the prize. Now this, uh, the, the paper, the, the green blood inspired uh, Erwin Schrödinger to write this book, What is Life? With the conclusion that perhaps uh, uh, the genetic material was some aperiodic crystal, as, as he emphasized. It didn't really bring any, any new information but it made people curious about this whole field. And it's said that it does kick off both Jim Watson and Francis Crick in their attack on DNA. Now, let me look at the, at the 30s and see what dominated the field then. Wendell Stanley was studied tobacco mosaic virus. And he received a shared Nobel Prize for preparing and look what it says, uh, their preparation of enzymes and virus protein in a pure form. But this wasn't protein in a pure form. What he had, he had crystals of tobacco mosaic virus. And that was, of course, fascinating. Th something that is alive could form crystals, could be dissolved, showed to be infectious. Of course, this stirred the, the imagination of scientists. But what Stanley overlooked was that two British scientists has shown in the end uh, 30s that there's 5% of RNA in tobacco mosaic virus. He overlooked that. And when he gave his Nobel lecture, it's interesting to see. You know, he did, at this time, when I started to learn to know the size of, of virus particles. <coughs> and uh, you can see a little further down, it says gene, Miller's estimate of max size, 20 times 1, 2 three, a little line there, and what, what does that mean? I mean and then is that the size of a gene or, yeah, so probably Stanley thought that, that the gene was some kind of protein, and, uh, and, uh, and that was uh, where he uh, ended up in his thinking. Now, throughout the years mentioned, I've had the privilege of being involved in writing about Nobel Prizes, and if you think about it, uh, the first book was published in, 19, uh, in, in 2010, 
and it's more of a general book where I discuss selected fields and also the whole machinery of the, of the Nobel Prize work. But then I realized this must be the ideal retirement involvement because every year new archives are being revealed. So you could keep going. The next book went on in 1960, 61, 62. And from there on, once you get going, it's just 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68. And the most recent book that I'll, I'll show later is in 69, 70, 71. So you can keep going until you hit the wall, really. Huh? But, but you learn amazing things. I mean, you, you understand how knowledge grows. And, and I would argue that the Nobel archives that we have is an exceptional real-time analysis of how knowledge grows. And uh, of course, the limitation is, is that made by Swedish scientists, so it depends on how well informed they are. Uh, it's written in Swedish, so it helps to have Swedish as your native tongue. But they, this has been a, a great, great joy to keep on learning and try to understand what the growth of knowledge really is. So we talked about phages, and here is Felix de Rell in his laboratory in the end of the 19, or in, an, in around 1920, and he was the original discovery of the bacteriophage. But there was an Englishman also, Twart, who had done some similar observations a few years earlier. And the first chapter in, in the most recent book, uh, it, it deals with all the evaluations of, of the real and why didn't he get the prize? Should he have had the prize? And then he was reviewed during some 15, 20 years and eventually he never got the prize, which probably I would say is correct. But these viruses, if you plated them on, 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 on an agar plate with bacteria, you could see plaques. You could count the number of bacteriophages that there were and this was really simplified the, the, the development of, of the field. But the real, his primary goal was not to st study the, the biological nature of bacteriophages. He wanted to use bacteriophages to treat human diseases. And he pursued that in many different contexts. But his, the publications never are conclusive. Uh, but the theme is still, still relevant. I mean, even today, when you have an uh, antibiotic resistant strain, could we combine some bacteriophages and to knock out this particular bacterium? And surprisingly, in the Soviet Union and associated countries, they have continued to use bacteriophages to treat both local infections, systemic infections, and uh, so um, the real left a considerable imprint, uh, but in the end, he never received a Nobel Prize. Then came, so Max Delbrick, when he was uh, in, at Caltech, learned through uh, Ellis, who was a scientist that learned to know about bacteriophage, and he realized, now this is the, the, probably the ideal system. A growth curve that was developed within half an hour, production of a lot of new particles. You could uh, identify different characteristics and so forth. And on the same time, Salvadore Luria, who had an Italian origin, who left uh, Europe just before the Second World War broke out. And by aid of, of Italian colleagues in uh, the US, started their career there and they strike, st struck it up. And, uh, and for the first time, one, one really seriously considered, so bacteriophages have genes. And therefore, this will be an ideal system of, if you have a number of mutants, you can compare them. And it was what, what was done in the 1940s. And uh, this team, uh, so Max Delbrick, he was for three years at Vanderbilt University, and one of those years, Salvador Luria was there also. But there was, yeah, I wanted to just mention another important thing that happened during this time was that for the first time, one could see virus particles. And then we talk about the early 40s. And that the two brothers, Ruska 
Ernst and Helmut Ruska, who in, at Siemens developed the electron microscope during the Second World War, and who for the first time could see various particles in 1940-41, including bacteriophages. And that was quite a major advance. Uh, in parallel, later on, Anderson in, in the US, using the RMC electron microscope, uh, could also see the virus particles. And then that, as you can understand, that makes an enormous difference. If you can see the things that you are, are uh, working on. And Helmut Ruska, in fact, he traveled quite a lot in the US after the, the war had ended to share his, his knowledge. Now, important contacts for Delbrück, Luria, and Alfred Herschel that I haven't shown a picture of, uh, is the Cold Spring Harbor. They were interacting with uh, the director Demerek of uh, Cold Spring Harbor, and they argued, could we arrange courses that we could train people to work with bacteriophages? And they initiated such courses, and they carried on for more than 20 years. And they also had conferences, high-class conferences, discussing the advances in genetics. So Cold Spring Harbor is an extremely charming, informal place. I have had the privilege of, of working there myself for periods, and uh, it, it's science in a way that, at, at its best. Now, we shouldn't leave the field of nucleic acids, uh, the, his history, without talking about Oswald Avery. Now, he had learned that pneumococci that Griffith has studied, they could have different properties, which were different sugars. And they, so he could characterize a particular strain of pneumococci. And then he had the idea, I think, that it is DNA and not protein that is carrying the genetic information. And they did very careful studies, extracting DNA by all the techniques available at the time, and uh, ending up with a less than 1% protein contamination, and published that in Journal of Experimental Medicine. And still, it did not fly. It was such a major step to take, and, and Mursky at the Rockefeller Center, just he argued against it. No, there must be some contamination, there must be some protein. Uh, Avery, Avery must be wrong. Uh, however, uh, the British colleagues, uh, Henry Dale, uh, who was the, the, the Nobel laureate and was president speech in 44, he saw the writing on the wall, although it didn't have any impact. Here's a change to which, if we're dealing with higher organisms, we should accord the status of genetic variation. And the substance inducing it, the gene in solution, one is tempted to call it, appears to be a nucleic acid of the deoxyribose type. Whatever uh, it B, it is something which should be capable of complete description in terms of structural chemistry. This is extremely foresighted, but it is in 1944. And it took, as many of you probably know, still a number of years before the real breakthrough came. Uh, and one important step in that was in 1952. Uh, then techniques are developed by which you could label uh, nucleic acid and protein separately, or naturally then by, by phosphorus and by, by sulfur. And <coughs> um, Alfred Hershey and Marta Chase, they simply analyzed these double labeled bacteriophages, what happened when they infected bacteria. And the finding was, of course, yes, the phosphorus entered uh, the, the bacterium, but not the sulfur. You, you would think that there would be a really an, an, a very powerful argument for the role of DNA, and still, still, uh, it was uh, so, so much hesitant in the scientific community. And there were evaluations by the Nobel Committee saying that, no, maybe Avery is right, but we need to see some more of that. Avery dies in 1955. In 1956, Arne Tiselius, the Nobel laureate in chemistry in 1948, 
writes a review saying we have made a major mistake. Avery should have had a Nobel Prize. But then comes a story about DNA and, and that, of course, you, you can easily talk for an hour about that. But there were two groups in, in London, outside London, uh, one at King's College, uh, with the, where Morris Wilkins was active and where Rosalind Franklin arrived in the, the early 1951 and was there for two years. She was you know, a very, very bright scientist. She had no idea about genes or about DNA or anything, but she did some crucial, crucial discoveries. The most famous thing is called Photograph 51. And there's a play called Photograph 51 also. Because this picture, that by ways that have been discussed, eventually Watson and Crick got hold of, turned the whole thing. Because when Crick saw this, he said, it must be a double helix. So, and this has been, so much has been written about this, about Rosalind Franklin. And uh, it's clearly that, that, that she was very, very pioneering. There are th three books about her, in fact. But then we could look at Aaron Klug's Nobel lecture. Aaron Klug was one of her first graduate students. And he said, it was Rosalind Franklin who set me the example of tackling large and difficult problems. Had her life not been cut tragically short, she might well have stood in this place on an earlier occasion because she contracted ovarian cancer and died in 1958. She is never reviewed because that's one puzzling thing uh, and that concerns, the, the, first of all, the discovery here, uh, February 28, 1953, with a crick, and look what they used as a pointer, a slide rule. That is the computer of that time. And uh, so they clear they, they hit on something in finding this, the double helix. And of course, at the pub late at night, they said, we have found the molecule of life. And so it was a, a gigantic exp finding. But it's not that simple. If you, if you start to reflect on how do you replicate DNA? Well, the two strands run in anti-parallel. So one of them you could do with an enzyme that runs all along the the, the, the DNA strand, but the other one had to be going the other direction. So, so here was a lot of questions that Delbruck was attacking this heavily, saying, no, you, you have to show one, one, one that you really can replicate this. Eventually, Mesut and Stahl could show that, yes, this reproduction, it does function. And, um, but, so this is in 1953. And in 1953, the uh, Nobel Committee uh, for chemistry was evaluating Sanger. Sanger's fantastic characterization of the structure of insulin. And I find it as a time document that shows what was the thinking at that time. And remember, this is probably Sweden's most well-known biochemist who is himself received the Nobel Prize two years later, 1955. What does he write? The independent amino acids do not show a tendency to display, de display any kind of periodicity, but appear to be positioned without any rule after each other, however, always in a given place. There are no reversals in the position of related amino acid, like for example, leucine, isoleucine. Thus, each insulin molecule should be exactly identical, and this is important to all others, myitaxin and Earlier, one had been reluctant to believe that protein molecules should be reproducible in the smallest detail. But finally, thanks to Sanger, one realized that is the case. But how would it be possible to conceptualize the synthesis of proteins? If there's no periodicity or other predetermined order that can be traced in the polypeptide chains that form proteins, one would be forced to assume that the formation even of the simplest protein, like insulin, it's not that simple, 29 plus 31, I mean, that's it's uh, would require perhaps some 50 different absolutely specific enzymes to attach each individual amino acid one at a time 
until finally the chain is complete. What is missing here is the reflection of could there be a code? And that was really the, the most critical derivation of Watson and Crick was when Garmov said, there must be a code. But can it really be that simple? Could it be that if you have four bases, that they, by some code, would determine the position of 20 amino acids. So that would require more than two bases without three bases. It must be a triplet code. And of course, to us, it, I mean, it, 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 it's so obvious that, that, that this is the way it is. But um, uh, at the time, it was a guiding step. Yeah, I'm showing this picture just because at this time, one had also extracted RNA from tobacco mosaic virus and show that it was infectious. So the nucleic acid was infectious. And uh, they were very close to get a Nobel Prize, but eventually didn't receive a Nobel Prize. And then in the end 50s, one started to give a lot of Nobel Prizes for nucleic acids. In 1957, Lord Toll received a work for his work on nucleotides and nucleotide coenzyme, a very skilled chemist that that kicked off a very excellent work in the endocrine. And then in 1958, Beadle and Tatum had decided to use another simple system uh, for looking at the genes, and, uh, which was an, 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 a certain mucus uh, structure. And uh, they had also shown that there's one gene, one enzyme, and so forth. Um, that prize in '58 also includes uh, Joshua Lederberg, who had done very, very pioneering genetic work with, with uh, bacterial material. Lederberg was the second youngest Nobel laureate ever. He was 33 years old. The only one younger than him was Banting, the discovery of insulin. And whereas Jim Watson was 34 when he received this prize. Uh, so le these are very tall figures in, in the development of genetics. And then one was very enthusiastic about it. In 59, we gave another prize to Severo Ochoa and Arthur Kornberg. This has later shown to be not that well researched. So Severo Ochoa said that he had found an enzyme that could replicate RNA. But there is no such enzyme in cells. So what he had was an enzyme that was breaking down RNA that occasionally could actually synthesize some RNA also. So, so that is wrong. And then he, was, he really felt guilty about this. And therefore, he was very, very active in trying to get, into an, to get another prize for the genetic code, which he did. But he used his whole laboratory for it. Arthur Kornberg, his enzyme, also was not synthesizing DNA, it was degrading DNA. And his son finally found the proper DNA polymerase that could synthesize new DNA. But uh, you need not question him, he's such an, an incredible scientist, uh, if you reflect on all the, the influence he had had in, in his work on, on nucleic acids. Now, one would think, that the discovery of DNA in 53 would prompt nominations. But look at this, it, isn't it quite surprising? It takes seven years before the first nominations for a prize to Watson and Crick is, is made. And uh, over three years here, there are uh, not an impressive number, but there are a number of nominations, of course. And a, one, a person who wanted to direct it was, was Bragg, who was the chairman of the, of the laboratory in Cambridge. His idea was that he would try to get Kendrew and Peru, the, the, the prist protein crystallographers, to get a prize in physics, and then to get Watson and Crick to get a prize in chemistry. But um, Watson and Crick certainly were not chemists. So eventually, Arnotiselius, who I mentioned before, very influential in this work, he decided 
We're going to do it this way. We let the Karolinska Institute take care of the prize to Watson and Crick and Wilkins, who was included for political reasons, and we'll, we'll give the prize in chemistry to Perus and Kendrow. And that is what happened in 62. And here, Crick is receiving his Nobel Prize from the, His Majesty the King, and Watson is waiting in line, and Wilkins further back. And of course, Perus and Kendrow already have received their diplomas at this particular event. But what about Nobel lectures? So, so much had happened between 1953 and uh, 1960 uh, or 62 that, uh, of course, Wilkins, he spoke about DNA. That was all he knew. But Watson, he didn't mention DNA. He talked about RNA. He was involved in studies of RNA and uh, he wanted to be the first on identifying messenger RNA and uh, so on. And Crick, he spoke on the genetic code. He hardly, hardly mentioned the, the DNA. And, uh, so. This is just an indication of what fantastic development there had been during a short time. And uh, there were other scientists, and I won't dwell on this. Seymour Benzer, uh, he used uh, the phage uh, genes to, to study the structure of genes down to the individual nucleotides. And, uh, and this had a role in understanding the final, the triplet code. And Sidney Brenner, who is really, is the, I mean, if I would pick one person who has had the most influence in science, I think it's Sidney Brenner. And he had, uh, he was doing amazing uh, things that uh, stop codon and, and triplet codon <coughs> in the end 50s. <coughs> but he, uh, uh, he didn't get a Nobel Prize until in 2002, where man finally managed to find another discovery of his C. elegans system and gave a Nobel Prize for that. And that was highly appropriate, of course. Uh, he, uh, I, I cite him often in my book. I had the privilege of following his career and actually I met him out in Singapore just three weeks before he died. But what about Shargaff? Shargaff did very important work in the 40s using uh, electrophoresis, and he showed that uh, it wasn't so, that nucleic acids should look all the same. On the contrary, if you purify them, they have very different um, base compositions. But in particular, he showed that A always equals T, and G always equals C. And that is actually cited in Watson and Crick 1953 paper, whereas they do not cite Avery, which is really an, an overlook. But anyhow, so Shargaff got a little upset. I, mean, I should have been in on that prize. I've been made very important work on it. Uh, and he was nominated later on, and, and he was even accepted that he could receive a prize, but he never received one. And uh, so they're, they're not. Nobel Prizes for, for everyone, but he did very important work in the end 40s and early 50s in straightening out the variability of uh, nucleotide representation in nucleic acid and the ATGC concept, which of course is fundamental. So we come to 1968, and I won't dwell on this, but the, the, in this year one had a complete picture of the genetic code and uh, it, this is primarily uh, an effect uh, of um, the work by Marshall Nirenberg at NIH. But Gobind Corona was a fantastic skilled scientist in making synthetic nucleotides. And, he was, and uh, Robert Holly was the first one to isolate transfer RNA to determine the sequence of nucleotides on that. And that is the background for his prize. So here, nothing new to do, this is, so nature has not made things more difficult than what they need to be. A triplet code that decides the 20 amino acid with some stop codons, and variable number of triplets that can identify the different 
uh, amino acids. So here Max Delbruck receives his prize in 1969. And uh, then Alfred Hershey also receives his prize the same year. And finally, Salvador Luria receives his prize that particular. And that is the first part of this most recent book that I have published. But, and at this time, it was known that the genome in a bacteriophage is one single strand. There are just two free ends here. You see it with the Klein-Smith technique, and all this DNA is, of course, is packed into uh, this, the head of the bacteriophage. And one also learned to know that, that this is a, a way by which, uh, first of all, the DNA is packed into the head of this by a motor that is in that uh, long tail. And uh, the volume of the head is 1.02 of, the, of that, the, the, the amount of DNA required to, to be fully infectious. And then it serves as an, uh, 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 it can inject this. Now, what about this original question about, could one learn about uh, the size of a gene by, by irradiation? And of course, today we know uh, as it's currently known, their size varies enormously, genes. Now, this variation ranges from a 76 base pairs that constitute one kind of transfer RNA to the muscle protein titin, an acronym or origin from the world titanic protein, specified a gene represented by more than 100,000 base pairs. So, so it's not a meaningful question to ask if, uh, if, what is the size of a gene, but I couldn't know this at the time. So this is my uh, latest, last picture, and it shows the, um, uh, the, six, the sixth book that I, the fifth book that I published, and uh, the lady in the middle here is Gerti Kori, of Czech origin, and, and a Jew. She and her husband Karl Kori, also from here, decided we cannot develop our science in Europe. So they went to the United States and they built a fantastic research unit at, in St. Louis where they trained some seven or eight forthcoming Nobel laureates. There was something unique about that. And I think that it was very rather attractive to give her the center stage in the end of this book. And the king is Gustav the fifth out of, he was there when the first Nobel Prize was delivered in, in two, 1901, and this was the last time that he could uh, bestow a Nobel Prize. With this, I thank you for your interest, and it uh, been a pleasure to share this information with you. Erling, thank you so much for a lovely talk, and I guess uh, we really appreciate to go through uh, all these uh, fascinating stories, uh, which uh, I guess uh, are also important from general education. So it's always important, even working in molecular genetics or virology or whatever, to uh, at least once a while to go through uh, roots of uh, molecular genetics and uh, to uh, repeat what was <coughs> Uh, going on actually before uh, anyone starts to work on something more advanced or something like this. Yeah, okay, so the talk lecture is uh, uh, just uh, open for, uh, for your questions. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your nice lecture. Sometimes you mentioned uh, the Nobel Prize for medicine and uh, physiology, and sometimes it was vice versa, right. physiology or medicine. So what is correct uh, or so, official? Uh, okay, <laughs> so, sorry about that. It's physiology or medicine, and it's there in, in Alfred Nobel's will. But what may be even more important is the word discovery. So in in physics, we can give a prize for a discovery or an invention. In chemistry, for a discovery or an improvement. But in physiology or medicine, only discovery. So we have to discuss all the time, what is a discovery? How do you compare discoveries? 
and then what the, the decisive dim dimensions of that. Okay, thanks a lot for explanation. It's, it's rather confusing, yeah. Okay. I would like also thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. And uh, I have a remark and, uh, and a question. Uh, when I entered the medical school in 1966, the Genetics in this country, to teach genetics in this country was allowed only for a quite short time because it was in the 50s, it was forbidden. Yep. Uh, because the communists believed that the external conditions are primarily responsible for uh, behavior and also for, for uh, regulation of many processes. Yep. So they saluted in Russia or in Soviet Union, very simple. They forbidden that. Exactly. And later this country just jumped in some direction which was already opened by Mendel. And I was lucky to be one of the first years of medical students to listen from Professor Sekla, who is a Czech very famous genetics uh, uh, lectures and uh, lessons on, uh, on genetics. But later, you know better than it was for the first time, uh, some 15, 20 years ago, the dis discussion started if the, about the external conditions which can modify uh, the genes. And the discussion is about epigenetics. Yep. And which is, of course, a little bit balancing uh, the original concept that genes uh, are only responsible for what is happened with their products. And I would like to ask you about your opinion. Uh, what is in this balance? Uh, epigenetical factors, which are the factors of the external milieu, or the genes, what is more important, or if it's possible to find some sort of expressing of the balance for each gene, or how it could be developed in the future. Right. Uh, so my answer would be that the primary role is that of the direct effect of genes. But there are examples, as you say, of epigenetics. Like, for example, the starvation in the Netherlands and how that transferred to coming generations. So there are epigenetics. but. Uh, I would argue that that's a, a minor part of, of this, and, 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 and the emphasis is on the way that, that, that the genes are interacting. So. <coughs> yes, I, I have a, actually a question, what is your opinion? So we have here very straightforward line, gene, viruses, and, ex, and cellular uh, signaling. Now, there is a lot of studies on the extracellular vesicles, and so the concept of the virus is diluted because there is a something what is a virus on one end, and there is an extracellular vesicle on the other hand, and then there is something between. And so I think that whether this concept will not change to the concept genes, viruses, and extracellular signaling. Because there is a very, very much known and unknown on the extracellular vesicles, which are actually very similar to the viruses. Sure. And viruses are extracellular vesicles. So there, there's, of course, as you well know, a difference between viruses and viruses. I mean, certain RNA viruses carry the enzyme with them. They can get the whole thing started, and they can do it without any interaction with DNA. Others have to uh, st stimulate the production of the enzyme. So DNA viruses have different behaviors also, and they can integrate and they can replicate inside of them. So the, it's a very, very diverse field. And, um, and there's no yeah. common denominator to this. I mean. What we know from the uh, electron microscopy of, the, uh, of the, some viruses in the classical textbook, so this is not actually the infectious entity. The infectious entity is together with some surface of the extra of the cellular material. So 
and this is, let's say, hepatitis A. And, um, yeah, yeah, so, sure. So, and, and, and the virus envelope is a mixed product yeah. of cellular components and of virus components. Oh, yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting lecture. So I like your retirement plan to every year the archive opens, right? So you can move year by year. Who coined this 50-year quarantine and why is it 50 years and not 40 or 60? Is there, yeah, what, what's, the, what's the rationale between for keeping these archives closed for half a century? So originally, uh, the, the, the archives were secret for all future. Then we discussed this, and, and 50 years is a very long time if you look at the secrecy of, of, of documents. And uh, there have been complaints about this, like, for example, our colleagues in Oslo, they would like to, uh, to shorten this period. But we stayed with them uh, over the 50 years, and I think that's something that, that's, uh, that is, uh, can be argued for that, that long time period. There is an, just to share that with you, a very special situation that I have. Because I became professor of virology at the Karolinska Institute in 1972. And because my predecessor, Sven Gard, was very influential in the Nobel Prize work, I became an adjunct professor, uh, an adjunct member of the committee in 1973. And from there on, I had 25 years of work on the Nobel Prize. So if and when I can conclude another book, I can read my own reviews, <laughs> and there's a certain amusement to that. Why did you write that? Well, that's not, so that's a very special case. So this 50 years is like you don't want the key players to be around when the archives yeah. open. So, uh, and, and that is different for different prizes also. In physiology and medicine, we can write about people that are still alive. So I've written about Jim Watson, about Thomas Weller, when they uh, were alive, and he, Jim is still alive. Uh, whereas in physics, we are not allowed to do that. So it differs a little. And, and uh, of course, the one is the, it's the responsibility of the Karolinska Institute, and the other of the Swiss Academy of Sciences. So. Thank uh, you. OK, so another question. <laughs> One small question about the viruses, which perhaps you will find that I'm not virologist very easy. Uh, but you told, uh, or you quoted uh, one back about early 20s, who called viruses something like flying genes. And as far as I know, the viruses had to be here as a second after more complex cells like bacteria. And my question is, what is the sense of viruses to transfer genes from one creation to, to other to perhaps to glue part of their uh, nucleic acid to, to the original uh, nucleic acid of the host to somehow to facilitate evolution, or had it some other sense, yep. or biological uh, sense, if we are able to speak about it? Actually, that is a, it's a very good question. So when life started in this world 3.8 billion years ago, then, uh, uh, of course, the, the, the way the system developed was that it was some primitive forms of cells but viruses probably appeared very, very early on. I mean, we discussed, of course, the RNA world and so forth, the origin of RNA viruses. And the point that, um, of the viruses is that they could do, of course, vertical gene transfer, but also horizontal gene transfer. And I think that that dimension, the horizontal gene transmission, has been very instrumental in the evolution of more and more complex biological forms, actually. So, so it's a very, very seminal question. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your answers. And if, uh, okay. yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Thank you very much for a nice discussion. So Erlin uh, showing us uh, Corey's couple. So last time we were 
somebody suggested that uh, uh, actually in Prague, here in Prague city, there is no single street or square oh, that, named after that's a shame. Boris. That's it's a, a shame. shame. That's definitely a shame. So we're starting to... The, 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 yeah. Oh, that's, there, there, that's there true. are some plaques, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah okay, but okay. unfortunately no street. <laughs> so. Sadly, she died a bit early on in the end 50s. Mm -hmm. And she had done some work way back in the end 30s with radiation. So it could be something like mm -hmm. Marie Curie, actually. I see. That, that she had yeah. damaged her, her, her bone marrow and on that show she died. On that. But yeah. her husband, he carried on with good research yeah, yeah, at yeah. Harvard until the 1980s. And all that. This name for this place was also because of the Juliet Curie in the family, which was a very famous member of the French Communist Party, and which perhaps led to a uh, possibility to name after uh, Curie uh, the place here in Prague. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's never, right. never too late to intervene on that. Don't know. Yeah, okay. So maybe I have, yeah. I need to ask, to, 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 to raise one more question, actually, if there is no other. Uh, please, just uh, a short comment to COVID-19 in Sweden. So, because we were following Sweden uh, very carefully when uh, COVID-19 came, and uh, some, some of us were admiring Swedish uh, uh, epidemiologist general, so uh, he uh, looked very strong and uh, uh, and he actually didn't allow to compromise much. So what do you think about? So I think the way, first of all, uh, the, the way it was resolved in its fundamental discovery is quite amazing because I've had the privilege of working in Varoli from the time it was a biological scientist until it began, biochemical scientist. In the 1960s, if we were going to make a vaccine, it took 10 years, and you have to rely on, on various ways of studying interaction with virus and cells and so forth. And at the COVID-19, you sequence the nucleic acid. In 24 hours you have it, you have identified the virus. And then you add to that this incredible technique of, uh, of RNA that you can uh, stabilize so, so it can be expressed at genetic potential and uh, that it can be deposited into cells. <coughs> I think it's an e excellent illustration of what science can do. And, uh, and we should be proud of that. And people should be proud of that. Actually. Yeah, definitely. And then the other choices, yeah, that, that is, these are more uh, kind of social medicine. We, we kept our schools going and we did some other things that later on actually showed uh, not to be too bad, actually. So, so maybe we yeah. can learn from this. And, and, and yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your opinion, yeah. Sometimes I'm saying that uh, what uh, would be happen if uh, COVID uh, came, COVID pandemics uh, uh, came uh, 40 years ago before, uh, before we had uh, PCR yes, even yes, discovered it. So what yep. would be happen? So, and my opinion basically is that uh, having such, uh, let's say, immunochemical techniques like uh, uh, ELISA or uh, complement fixation, actually, or uh -huh. <laughs> that, other, uh, that's all we all we had in the yeah, 60s, would be probably the only something like antigen uh, tests, of course, also. So, and uh, what do you think? My, I would bet that uh, we could manage it uh, even equally bad, badly than we did with PCR and all these, uh, all these uh, uh, high-tech and yep. high-throughput uh, approaches. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think we have these remarkable tools in our hands. So when the next pandemic comes, we're going to manage that more efficiently than what we did this plan. Yeah. And, and um, we try uh, you, what you're after. We need to harmonize this a little around the world so we don't use different rules. Yeah. And I mean, China has paid an enormous price by this intense 
isolation. So we see. Yeah. 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 No, right. we should be yeah. proud of this fantastic yeah. development. Yeah. 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 Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much. So, is there any other question? So, if not, then uh, thank you so much, Erlin, for really great talk and and great uh, books. Actually, you have published already, and. Uh, in uh, and the next book is ahead actually so <laughs> yeah 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 year project so yeah, yeah, no yeah. and you uh, can never i mean at this mature age you cannot calculate them yeah, yeah. So what luck you have in yeah, yeah. so so far i've had a lot of luck <laughs> so thanks thanks a lot and uh, of course uh, audience to to the audience thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and uh, if uh, anybody of you uh, likes to join us for dinner, so I would be, we would be really happy. So please take it as a. <laughs>